Greetings, this is Jacob from RoboFlow, here today to talk about the Common Objects and Context Dataset, or the COCO Dataset. Before we dive into a little bit deeper dataset introspection, we're going to see here just an example of exactly what the COCO Dataset allows us to do, and what the COCO Dataset allows us to train models to be able to see and understand. So here you can see that I have an object detector running based on the COCO Dataset detecting a person. So here you can see that the the model is detecting basically the bounding box in which it sees me as a person. Let's see what else it can detect. So here, uh, I'm going to bring in a new object. Oh, there we go. We can see that it's detecting a book. Um, and it's doing a decent job of that, bounding a box around where it sees the book is. Uh, let's try it on a different object. Here, I'm going to try to see if it can identify my cell phone. Oh yeah, it's doing a pretty good job there. And now let's see if we can stump it. Um, here I have another object. Uh, this one, it's missing. It's There we go, I thought it was a sandwich there for a second. Sports ball, oh wow, frisbee. Um, okay, so you can see it's not doing so good at detecting a yellow cup there. Uh, so basically the motivation of the COCO dataset is to see how well we can get these models to understand common objects in context, like books, cell phones, people, and cups. Um, and the better and better that models start doing on the COCO dataset is what's defining the state of the art in computer vision. So now jumping in and taking a look at the state of the art, here we have the leaderboard for the COCO dataset. So this is what really is all the buzz in computer vision these days. Is, uh, it's, it's a lot of object detection and it's a lot of how well are these models doing on the COCO dataset. So here uh, we have the leaderboard, and we can see basically here the box AP, which is a measure of performance of how well these models have been doing over time. And you can see that it is just a rising tide. The models are getting better and better. They're getting bigger. They're getting more efficient. They're getting uh, the convolutional networks that form the backbone of these detectors are improving. The neck of the object detector where these features are being pooled is, is getting researched and improved. And the way that the training techniques are deployed is also uh, really pushing the state of the art in, in object detection on the COCO dataset. So here, most recently, we can see that the leader, the number one model on the COCO dataset, is Efficient Debt D7X. And this is a recent release of Efficient Debt, um, because you can see here that it used to be down here, but now the D7X is really the highest one, beating out Detecto RS, which is you know really exciting news. And you can see here that they're measuring all of these based on box AP. So below, we actually have a link uh, for a little more details on what uh, MAP is. But uh, for now, you can just think of it as a measure of performance. Um, but the goal of this video is going to be really to understand what is going into the data set that forms this average precision metric. And what are we exactly measuring when, when we're looking um, at, at this metric and what, what is the data set and how can we uh, maybe improve uh, performance on this data set just by knowing more about it. Um, so now kind of moving along, uh, here you can see the maximum box AP. So this is just the very best that any model can do on the COCO data set. But in reality, you're going to be more seeing graphs like this one, which is basically how well is a model doing on the COCO data set relative to how long it takes to do inference. So the, the faster the inference, probably the smaller the model and the faster to train and it's a little bit more tractable. So smaller models are definitely better and we want to prefer this. And uh, you'll see the COCO a AP val um, on the, on the y-axis. So that is how well is the model doing on the COCO validation set. Um, and this is done for a lot of preliminary research before people actually test on the testing set, which is, which is held back by, by the Microsoft COCO dataset providers. So here we can see we have a couple models compared. This is the efficient debt lineage, which is the smaller efficient debt models, um, compared to YOLO v5, which is a state-of-the-art object detector for um, fast, uh, fast and performant inference. Um, another important thing, even though there's more details in the MAP video below, uh, to know about uh, the average precision metric is that it's averaged across all class labels in the COCO dataset. So as we go and dive deeper into what the data set is, it's going to be important to remember that this object detector is, is measured as a mean across all class labels 
So no matter how well populated the class, this metric is gonna be measuring across all of those. So if you really wanna be beating this metric, you're gonna to have to be able to recognize all class labels, including yellow cups, or rather just generally cups. Um, so now uh, taking a look at what is uh, what all is in the Coco data set. So here I have the most recent uh, Microsoft Coco um, or one of one of the original Coco uh, papers. Um, and here they segment out uh, some of the goals of what they're trying to annotate in the data set. Um, so let's say you have an image. Uh, there's a variety of ways you can actually extract data out of this image and try to train models to extract data out of the image. Uh, so the first way is classification. This is just saying basically what is in the data set. So uh, in this upper left image here, you see that there's people, there's sheep, and there's a dog. Um, so you could just kind of keep it at that very base classification level. Um, and then you could also go further and try to localize objects and localize them with boxes. Um, computers are, are, are good at kind of making floating point estimates and uh, therefore the box is a convenient way to, to, to do object localization. Um, and then you localize that and then you attach a class label to it um, as we saw with a detector as it was recognizing that I was a person and that uh, this was a book. Um, now you can go further from just plain box detection and you can do actually semantic segmentation which is defining the outline of objects. Um, and then uh, also they went even further and they determined, you know, rather than just doing semantic segmentation around objects, they se segmented those out into distinct objects. So now diving in a little bit deeper into what all is in the data set. So this is the uh, Coco data set explorer. Here you can see that there's uh, over 100,000 images, which is a very large data set. It takes a long time to train and it is, it is a very powerful data set uh, and over actually 800,000 instances of objects. So in the Cocoa Explorer, you can uh, come in at cocoadataset.org uh, backslash hashtag explore, and you can get a feel for kind of what is what are the objects in, in the data set. So here in this map, we can see that there's um, a variety of class labels, and all of these class labels are um, kind of broken out here into natural category groups. So here we can see that we have food, um, we have electronics, and these are kind of like everyday objects. And with the Explorer, we can click on an object and we can actually see examples of that. So a fun one might be elephants. Let's see what kind of elephants are in the data set. Okay, so there's 2,000 uh, results of images that actually have elephants. And there we go. Uh, you can see here they have the masks over the elephants. So you can see where the semantic segmentation of the elephants lies. Um, now, another cool thing about this is you can see uh, instances where the objects actually appear in tandem. So let's say I want to see all examples of, uh, let's say, elephants and laptops. Let's see what we get back. Oh, so actually zero results. So there actually are no images where uh, elephants are appearing in the context of laptops. That's not too surprising. What about TVs? Let's see. It's taking a little while to run. Means there might be some examples. Okay, there's five results of elephants and TVs. Oh, and it looks like maybe the elephants on screen there or the elephants a figurine. Um, and oh, here we go. We have, looks like an elephant in, in an airport bay. Anyways, this is a good example of what this data set is. It's just all kinds of random objects in context and they've tried to choose maybe the 80 most prevalent objects um, to bin into classes and then, and then to annotate from there. So now going a little deeper, we're gonna take a look at the Microsoft Coco dataset within RoboFlow to use the RoboFlow dataset health check to see how deeply we can actually analyze a dataset from that point of view. So now uh, I've loaded the Microsoft Coco dataset into RoboFlow, which RoboFlow can indeed handle datasets of this size, and it, it's a, a very powerful tool to be looking at your data. Um, so here in the dataset front page, there's a few things we can do. Um, as we create dataset versions, we can add pre-processing steps, so we can actually um, kind of morph the dataset and do some things like grayscaling and tiling and resizing to uh, go into a model. We can modify the classes. So 
if I decided there was a class that I didn't want in the Cocoa data set, I could remove it or I could rename it. Um, and then finally, there's uh, an ability to make augmentations. So here you can actually vastly increase the size of your data set uh, by doing things like rotation or adding noise or adding blur or using mosaic, which actually is a very interesting example where you can be uh, putting objects in different corners of, of the image. Um, this helps make your data set a lot larger. With the Cocoa data set, this is a little bit less important because you already have a lot of examples. But in a sparser data set, augmentations can be a very important thing to bring your detector up to the performance you need um, without having to go gather and label more data. Um, and then a very powerful tool once your data is loaded into RoboFlow is by looking at the data set health check, we can really determine what is going on inside of the data set. So here we have the Cocoa data set, uh, the validation set, looking at the data set health check. So first of all, we can see there's 5,000 images in the validation set for the Cocoa 2017 object detection data set. We can see that there's 36,000 annotations, and we can see that there's a class balance here. Um, here we can see that you know, of those 36,000 annotations, 10,000 of them are people which means that the Cocoa data set is actually really predominantly a people data set. Um, and dropping off from there, we can see the objects dropping off in prevalence. So here we have underrepresented, upper, underrepresented classes labeled in red, which actually um, is sort of indicating that this could be a, a dangerous area because it's very hard for an object detector to learn examples that it hasn't seen that many examples of. So it's, it's going to be very hard for our object detector to learn toaster, for example, because there's only, nine, uh, there's only nine examples in the validation set. So if the training set is 20 times that size, that means that there's probably only going to be 180 toasters to learn from uh, in the midst of, say, 200,000 people. So according to the last function, it's definitely going to be optimizing to be guessing people. That's going to be the default assumption, and it's going to be very hard to generalize down uh, all the way to the underrepresented toaster oven or stop sign or bear or snowboard. These are going to be hard class labels. And as we were talking before with the MAP metric, that is averaging across all classes. So it's going to be very difficult for the model to be getting good scores across the board on all these different classes, especially when it's, when it's very underrepresented. So that's a modeling challenge to be able to get through uh, a sparsely labeled data set like this. Um, another thing that the health check allows you to do is look at the dimension insights of the data set. So here we can see um, the different sizes of the images in the data set. So this basically the big takeaway here is uh, that the Cocoa data set is not a uniform size. The images are kind of all over the place. And this is important to remember as you're resizing images and keeping track of your annotations. These are all things that the RoboFlow platform does for you. Uh, and then the last feature here on the RoboFlow data set health check is the annotation heat map. So this lets you kind of start to look at the localization of your annotations. Notably, um, in, at, at a data set large level, it makes sense here that most objects are actually occurring in the middle of the data set, but you can see that um, there's less actually occurring on the corners and the edges. Um, and then you can filter by class label. So one class label of interest is actually umbrella. So we can see here that most of the umbrellas are actually occurring in the top half of the Cocoa dataset images. And that might be something that you want. You might say that, hey, you know, actually umbrellas are normally appearing in the upper half of the image, so therefore this is a safe assumption and our model might as well start to kind of learn this localization. But you also might sort of think to yourself and say, you know what, maybe that's something that I didn't want to happen and I don't want to miss umbrellas that are, say, laying on the ground. And then you would want to be going back to collect more images and to uh, help even out this distribution of where the localization of your images uh, is occurring. Uh, so that's all for the dataset health check, and that was a pretty comprehensive tour of the Cocoa dataset. The last thing I want to talk about is using the Cocoa dataset for pre-training and starting pre-trained checkpoints based on the Cocoa dataset. So one of the most powerful things about the Cocoa dataset is that it allows researchers to train very large models like efficient at D7X, and then we can take those pre-trained checkpoints from the Cocoa dataset, crystallize in model weights, and then start on a new task. Um, and this is called uh, transfer learning, and it's a very powerful way to utilize the Cocoa dataset. And a lot of models that you're going to look at 
from object detection models are going to ship you this pre-trained checkpoint and it's important to know what it is. So it's basically a model has been trained all the way through the Cocoa data set, the weights have been saved, and now you're using it to go on to your next task. So the model has already learned how to identify different features and has learned generally the sense of what an object is. It's learned a vast array of objects, so that the object you're detecting might be something very similar. So for example, the Cocoa data set can identify people, which is uh, going to be able to identify me. So if I'm training a uh, detector to tell whether I have a mask or not, um, it might be very good to start with the Cocoa pre-trained checkpoint because it's already used to identifying people and has a sense of what a face is. Um, and then we can build our model from there. So lastly, I'm gonna show an example of using the Cocoa dataset as a pre-trained checkpoint. So here, if we go back over to mass.robaflow.ai, um, you can see we were at backslash coco before, and now we're gonna go over to backslash mask, and here it'll take a second for the model to load. But here you can see that uh, even with just a few epochs on a very small data set of 100 images, I've already started to get the model to understand uh, what it might look like uh, to actually not be wearing a mask or wearing a mask. So here you can see it's identifying me and saying no mask in red and that is, uh, that is a bad sign um, given these times. And here's an example of using the uh, Coco dataset to launch in to uh, the next, uh, the next uh, detection of any object in the world. And this is really the way to leverage the Coco dataset to move into any object past the 80 classes uh, that they have given you in the data set is you want to take the pre-trained checkpoints, use them as, as a starting point, and get a custom data set, and then you'll be able to move much faster than if you had uh, just started from scratch. So thanks for listening today. That was a deep dive on the Cocoa data set, and happy detecting.